Okay, switching gears now to talk about the scrotum and ultrasound. And um, this is a kind of a funny picture that somebody sent me of an actual testicle that seems to have a, a face on it. Like here's an eye, here's a nose, sort of looking up um, towards its owner, wondering about why it's in pain, maybe. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of funny captions that people wrote on this website where this uh, ultrasound appeared, but I'll spare you those um, inappropriate captions. So anyways, we're going to be talking about um, the testicles and uh, the scrotum in terms of the anatomy and how to acquire the images and uh, how to interpret them. And just to remind you of the uh, testicular anatomy, you know, we've got the spermatic cord and its vascular supply is uh, very superior and then we have, um, you know, the ductus deferens that comes down, and essentially you've got the epididymis uh, all all the way back here. It's a pretty large structure, the epididymis. You've got the head, the body, and the tail, of the epididymis. All of this is fair game on ultrasound. And then you've got the testicle itself, um, which is, you know, sort of broken down to where the seminiferous tubules are, and then the outside covering the tunica abuginea, and then the reedy testes is right between the testicle and the epididymis. And all the stuff you can see on ultrasound pretty, pretty easily, actually. The best equipment to use when you're doing um, ultrasound of the testicles is to take advantage of the fact that since the testicles are very superficial structures, you can use the linear uh, transducer. That 7.5 to 12 megahertz linear probe, it's got uh, excellent uh, image quality. You're gonna start with the, um, the grayscale and then move into the Doppler evaluation. And we're gonna talk a little bit about pulse repetition frequency and wall filters. It's good to examine your patient in a frog leg position, and uh, it helps to elevate the scrotum on a stack of towels. And you're gonna scan the entire contents of the scrotum, um, specifically looking at the, uh, the echogenicity of the testicles of the uh, epididymis and the spermatic cord. And the good news is you've got the, uh, the contralateral side as your, as your um, control. So you can always compare the two back and forth. I do that quite a bit. Many times I start on the normal side to try to get a beat on, on the anatomy and then move over to the, the affected side. And so I'm gonna show you a series of um, testicles here uh, that shows here um, the probe position. Um, and this is sort of a bad schematic, but this is supposed to be the, uh, the epididymis here, sort of the head, the body, the tail. Uh, the spermatic cord is up here, and this is the probe position. So you start in the sagittal plane here, and uh, the, the probe does pick up maybe a, a small portion of the epididymis, the head of the epididymis here. Uh, but this whole structure here is the, is the testicle. This is the scrotal skin uh, seen up here. And then we, uh, we move the transducer uh, maybe a little more superiorly here. Now we're along the, uh, the long axis of the epididymal of the head of the, uh, the epi epididymis as it comes around here. We can see it just, uh, just along here um, with the spermatic cord seen up here. So spermatic cord, uh, head, head of the epididymis, and then the superior portion of the, um, of the in this case, the left testicle uh, seen here, although this diagram does um, have it on the, on the right side as we're looking uh, at the testicle. Remember, the left testicle hangs a little bit lower. Um, even though this is labeled as uh, left, the diagram is over the right side. Sorry for that confusion. They look identical on ultrasound, so it probably doesn't matter. Um, now, moving on to the tail of the epididymis, we can see now the tail is, is down here, and we we just basically slide the probe inferiorly, and we can see the tail of the epididymis down here. Again, scrotal skin is up here, and here's the testicle here. And then, uh, moving along, the next view is gonna be a transverse view. And now we've got a short axis here of the, uh, of the testicle, and we just basically you know, slide the probe um, along the testicle, and um, many times we can see a portion um, of the epididymis as well. And although in this portion here, all I do see is the testicle and the, the scrotal skin here. And then um, we just slide that probe down um, the testicle from the superior portion down towards the inferior portion, and noting the testicle itself for any changes in echogenicity, we wanna see a nice, um, isochoic texture to it, homogeneous. We don't want to see any areas of focal uh, masses or anything like that. And then there's something actually, it's called the cleavage window, and, um, and we can see both testicles this way in the cleavage window. Knowing that the, um, the left testicle hangs a little lower, 
we may need to uh, rotate the probe slightly to uh, have a, a true cleavage uh, window where we see both, the, basically the same axis of both testicles uh, at the same time. Again, the uh, right testicle, the left tes testicles here, and when you can see them both like that, um, that's what we call the cleavage window. So it's to compare the testicles, it's a nice view to compare the testicles on. And then if we bring the probe to the side of the scrotum, and now we can actually make out um, the a coronal axis of the, basically you see the entire epididymal body here. And um, if you get it just right by moving the transducer all the way to the edge of the scrotum, you can see the, the epididymis as well as the testicle. Um, it's the only view you're going to see the epididymis stretch out like that. Otherwise, you'd, as we saw on those sagittal views, we either saw the epididymal head or the or the tail, but this is a way to see the actual body of the epididymis. So we're going to talk about uh, the actual technique for scanning um, the acute scrotum in the emergency department. Now, I, a lot of feedback I've been getting is that people want to see more videos of actual probe placement and um, machine adjustment and things like that. So I think um, this is a good time to introduce that a little bit more heavily. This is, uh, everybody knows him as uh, Warren Weekman. Um, he's known uh, informally amongst his friends as Dub Dub um, for his initials, WW, or just Dubs, as, uh, as my son calls him. So, so we're going to talk about um, the actual technique for scanning um, the acute scrotum in the emergency department. So the key equipment here, you're going to use your high-frequency linear transducer, as pictured here. And as we come around and look at the machine settings, it's a couple important things that are very different between grayscale mode and color power Doppler that we're going to put on for the testicles. So once you find your actual image of choice, you're going to switch over to the Doppler settings. So press color over here, and you're going to choose from regular color over to color power Doppler or CPD. Now to make the machine a lot more sensitive to pick up the lower flow state that is within the testicles, you want to make sure the following settings are present. For the PRF scale or the pulse repetition frequency, you want to make sure that's in the 600 to 800 range, and to adjust that you can press up or down to get the appropriate frequency here. You also want to make sure that the wall filter is set to low. If it's not set to low, you can simply use the soft keys right here to adjust it to low. This key over here is a general setting, whereas if you don't have the ability to change the actual frequency, you can change from low, medium, to high. Um, again, low being the frequency of choice that you desire, and you can adjust the scale one more time by pressing scale down to 600 or 800. So one of the important parts of doing the scan is actually proper patient positioning. You'll see here the patient is laying supine, they're going to be in the frog-like position. And unlike other scans, what you want to do is get a roll of towels underneath the testicles to support them up and provide some support. That will also relieve any discomfort that they may have. You can also use a different towel here to pull the penis back so it's not directly in your field of vision. So the first thing is you want to do is you want to maintain with the indicator up towards the patient's head, you're going to do a long axis or sagittal view of the testicle by putting the indicator here, okay? And you'll fan through that testicle accordingly, okay? Next, you want to go in the short axis with the indicator towards the patient's right-hand side, scanning through the entire testicle in its short axis. A special view is called the cleavage view, which puts both testicles together, and you can compare them for different echogenicity, size, and shape. You will notice that the probe is angled a little bit more inferiorly as the left testicle hangs down a little bit lower. You'll then want to try and get a nice coronal view of the testicle with the indicator up towards the patient's head to view the epididymis as a whole. And we talk about Doppler quite a bit um, when, we, when it comes to the, um, to the testicles and other organs as well, but particularly here is where I find it to be most useful. And, um, you know, there's the pulse repetition frequency, or PRF. And the lower the PRF, um, the, the less amount of pulses that the machine is sending out, which means that it's spending more time listening than sending. And when you know, somebody's listening more, they're more sensitive. You could think about it that way. So the lower the PRF, the less talking, the more listening, and the more sensitive the uh, machine is. And so that's, this is a situation where you really want to lower that pulse repetition frequency down to six to 800 range. And then the wall filters, this is another thing that helps too. If you, if you put it on the low wall filter setting, that will also make the machine uh, more sensitive. 
And then you can also turn up the gain, like you can the, the grayscale gain. Well, you can turn up the color gain. When you're working with um, the uh, Doppler settings, the gain changes to color gain. So what used to be grayscale gain is simply color gain on the, on the machine. The button just changes its functionality to color. And um, the funny thing about uh, torsion is that um, you got to be very careful here because somebody can have torsion and then detorsion, meaning that they may have had testicular torsion at one point and then the testicle un, un, untwisted itself and, and now there's flow there again. In fact, the flow, once it detorses, can sometimes be uh, hyperechoic um, and, uh, or I should say not hyperechoic, but hypervascular. It can, um, once flow is restored to the testicle, it becomes um, extravascular and you may see a lot of flow there. And it may even confuse you. You may think you're looking at um, an infection like uh, epididymal orchitis when it's just actually um, detorsion that follow torsion. So there's a lot of caveats and pitfalls here, and you really have to put all this into the clinical picture, meaning that you're looking at this patient in front of you and you're trying to decide, is this patient more likely to have torsion detorsion or if this is more likely to have an infection? And a lot of that's based on their his, the way they're presenting their history and their physical exam. So with that caveat in mind, uh, there are some basic general principles here with regards to testicular torsion. So first of all, when you look at a testicle and you're trying to decide whether it's got flow or not, you got to look at the asymptomatic testicle first. and and get a good beat on how it's how the flow is to that testicle. When you slide the probe over to the testicle that you're concerned about and there's no flow seen to that testicle, well that certainly um, adds to your suspicion that this testicle is very, it could be torsed. And so that would make me very concerned if I saw flow on the other side in the same Doppler settings, I didn't see flow on the symptomatic side, well that's going to um, really make me want to find a urologist very quickly to help this testicle out. And then the other thing is, um, you can see flow around the, the, the surface of the testicles. That doesn't rule out torsion. Um, you need to see the flow uh, down in the testicle itself, the blood vessels that penetrate through the testicle. Th those are the blood vessels you're looking at. Because you can have capsular flow, which is around the outside, the surface of the testicle. But that's you need to see the centripetal vesicles, the vessels, the ones that run through the testicle. and. Um, Again, we can have hype, reactive hyperemia of the tunica vaginalis. That's not testicular flow. That's around the capsule. You need to see the penetrating vessels. Uh, and sometimes if the testicle isn't torsed enough, you can still see flow there. And so you got to be careful. That's why the presence of flow, again, it doesn't rule it out. Um, it just adds to your clinical uh, picture. So this is an example here of color uh, flow Doppler. Um, the blue is flow in one direction, and then the red is flow in another direction. In this case, the red is arterial, and the blue is venous. Well, how do we know? We put this, this is a combination of both color flow and pulse wave Doppler. So here's that little TIE fighter. That's the sampling gate. It's over the blue, which has a venous waveform to it down here. And this TIE fighter here is over the red, and it's got a, a more of a pulsatile pattern. A little bit hard to see on this one. I have another example here that's a little bit easier to see. We moved the probe into a sagittal plane from a transverse to a sagittal plane, and now we can see blue over here, kind of venous uh, waveform, and then over here, red here is a more of an arterial waveform. Um, but this is a normal flow pattern we can see here of just, um, there's arterial and venous flow uh, seen on this testicle here. This is a uh, not a sonocyte machine, this is a different machine called um, Siemens uh, Accuson. Um, and this is a cleavage window demonstrating uh, both um, both testicles at the same time, the right side and the left side, uh, you know, with the, the left side of the probe dipped down a little bit. And uh, we can see here both uh, arterial and venous flow to these uh, normal testicles in here. Now, um, if you don't, if you do have testicular torsion, what happens is um, even without the Doppler, just the grayscale alone, you have an enlargement of um, the testicle, the epididymis, and the spermatic cord below the point of torsion. Well, why is that? That's because as the testicle's twisting, initially it's the venous um, structures that get pinched off, and then the testicle can't 
unload its blood flow, and so it starts to get enlarged. And so even on grayscale, we see enlargement of the gonad. It's the same with ovaries, actually, too, we're going to talk about next session. Um, but, uh, but with the testicles uh, or the ovaries, either way, when they start to twist like that, it's the veins that get pinched off first. The, whoops, the artery is still flowing, but the vein is pinched off. Sorry about that. And so, because the artery is still flowing, the actual organ it gets enlarged. And so, um, when there's... Um, but the echogenicity of the gonad of concern is actually decreased. It's got a... a, a, a it looks darker than the other side does. So you can compare the two. This is a patient here um, who's actually got power flow on right now. Um, and um, we are assessing this testicle for, for flow, and there's no flow to this testicle. And in fact, if you looked at the other testicle, this is, it's, it's, this is hypoechoic compared to the other side. We're changing the gain settings a little bit here. Um, but no matter what we're doing here with our, with our settings, we can't get any flow to appear to this testicle as opposed to the other side. And uh, indeed, this patient did have testicular torsion. Um, again, you want to demonstrate flow to the asymptomatic testes and then using those same Doppler settings, um, bring it over. And this is um, the asymptomatic side. This is the symptomatic side on this patient here. Um, otherwise, you really can't make a lot of conclusions out about the symptomatic side. Some of the pitfalls here, um, you, um, you align the uh, vascular plane along the long axis. Um, you're going to do the other side as well for, to get an accurate comparison. You want to keep the uh, angle of incidence uh, at about 90 degrees uh, to the testes. That angle of incidence, um, we'll, we'll, you know, we're not talking about Doppler here, we're talking about just the grayscale. That offers the best uh, reflection and uh, reduces um, shadowing that can occur. So when you have that 90 degrees, um, uh, that perpendicular plane of the sound going into and then back out of the, out of the, the organ, um, you get a very nice echogenicity there. Any deviation from that can make it look hypoechoic. And um, with uh, epididymorchitis, again, uh, this is an infectious state, okay, itis, infection. You can have an epididymitis or an orchitis or a combined picture. Um, it's sort of a, a spectrum. Sometimes it starts with epididymitis and then moves into the testicle, and then you get the orchitis, epididymorchitis picture like that. And um, these characteristic findings, uh, again, you get this enlarged grayscale which sometimes it's difficult to tease it out from torsion or not. You definitely get hyperemia or hypervascular flow um, to, the, um, to the affected side. With, um, with infection, you get increased flow there. And it looks like this. So this is uh, epididymorchitis. We can see both the epididymis here as well as the, uh, the orchitis component. This is the head of the epididymis, very enlarged. And then we can see this, um, the testicles actually got a lot of flow as well to it. This black area here is an epididymal cyst, very common to see that in the epididymis. This is the spermatic cord up here, epididymitis, orchitis. This is the tail of the uh, epididymis here in a sagittal view. We can see the tail is very hypervascular as well as this testicle too is hypervascular. Epididymal orchitis. And uh, this patient here just has epididymitis. It's a little bit hard to see. This is the testicle over here. We move the flow box over here. We see kind of a normal flow pattern. But over here, we see very hyperemic flow to the epididymis. So this is epididymitis without orchitis here. Again, that's usually how it starts. What are some other uh, pathologies that we can see with the testicle? Well, we can see hydrocele's, basically fluid around the testicle. We can see spermatocele's um, and uh, varicocele's. We can see evidence of trauma, like a testicular fracture. And we can see abscesses as well within the testicle or within the scrotum. This is fluid seen um, around this testicle here, what we call a hydrocele. Um, and a, um, a, a, a varicocele is when you've got um, basically um, a dilation of the, uh, the venous plexus here. And it just looks like a bunch of tubes in there with, um, with blood in it, so varicocele. It's that, uh, I believe it's called the pampiniform um, complex, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's <laughs> drawing from my uh, years and years ago in medical school and anatomy, but that's where you have the, um, this vascular um, bed 
that gets a little dilated and we can see there's a blood flow in there. And then if we look on the other side of the same patient, um, this is what's known as a um, spermatocele. It's on the other side of the testicle here. It looks like uh, cystic structures here uh, in the spermatic cord. And, uh, and that's what a sper spermatocele uh, looks like. So fluid around the testicle, varicocele. Um, dilations in the spermatic cord, spermatocele. And then when we see um, that uh, venous complex dilated with um, blood in there, that's, that's a varicocele seen there. And then uh, abscesses, we can see an abscess within the testicle itself, this hypochoic debris that's inside that uh, testicle. Um, so that's a testicular abscess, and this is a scrotal abscess. It's kind of all zoomed in. It's hard to see where it is, but this is, looks like any other um, abscess anywhere else in the body. This happens to be in the scrotum um, or a scrotal uh, abscess. And so when you have a, a scrotal abscess like that, it needs to be drained. If, uh, if you get an overwhelming infection there that involves the rest of the perineum, um, you can... Um, be in a lot of trouble and the patients need to go directly to the OR for something called Fournier's gangrene. And uh, Fournier's gangrene is a type of very aggressive infection in the, uh, the scrotal perineal area. And, um, and um, patients can die from it very quickly. They need to go immediately to the OR to have it debrided. And uh, when you have loss of uh, homogeneity of the testicle, areas of focality, that is testicular cancer, it affects uh, young men. And this being uh, Movember, this is uh, Men's Health Awareness Month, and a lot of men, including myself, are sporting a mustache to raise awareness uh, to encourage uh, men to be aware of this, uh, any masses on their testicles, and this is how it can present, just a painless mass in the testicle. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. You see these uh, focal areas of uh, echogenicity here that is different from the rest of the testicle. And that's uh, obviously um, very easy to see with ultrasound. And then with trauma, we see this as well. Um, basically looks like a lot of hematoma in there. This is a patient with a fractured testicle. He was surfing down in San Onofre, and um, his surfboard went right up between his legs, uh, got him there in the testicle, and his testicle was fractured. He drove. He was trying to get home to Los Angeles, couldn't take the pain anymore, pulled off the freeway at UCI Medical Center and I scanned his um, testicles out there in triage. The one testicle looked normal, but this area over here, very, lots of uh, blood, it's, uh, and there's a little area there of his testicle that just um, was normal, but then suddenly abruptly stopped. That's the area of the testicular fracture, actually. Normal testicles down here, and the testicular fracture was seen along here. Lots of hematoma around it. This is another example of a scrotal hematoma. This is a normal looking uh, testicle here. We're just fanning through it, and then um, as we get uh, off to the edge of it, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, hematoma uh, adjacent uh, to this testicle once we move away from it there. And that's what uh, all this other stuff is here. This is all hematoma seen in this patient's scrotum um, who had a severe blow to the scrotum resulting in um, a lot of hematoma, that isochoic material. Parts of it are not congealed yet, so it looks more anechoic. Parts of it are echogenic. So to conclude, um, you want to use a high-frequency linear transducer. You want to look at uh, ultrasound both on grayscale and using color and power Doppler. Um, you want to lower the pulse repetition frequency, turn down that wall filter. That will make the, uh, the Doppler settings more sensitive. Um, it's important to put the patient in a frog leg position, have them uh, retract their penis back with a towel, and then allow the scrotum to be um, positioned in a way that you can do both this an anterior approach and a lateral approach to getting that coronal view and using that contralateral testicle as your control and you want to note the testicles for their size, their echogenicity, how they're aligned and their flow keeping in mind that uh, with torsion you want to look at the normal side first to make sure uh, you get a beat on how the flow looks and then slide the probe over to the abnormal side and uh, with infection it's the hyperemia that is the, uh, the hallmark of infection and uh, keeping in mind, you can see other things on the scrotum as well with ultrasound very easily. Hydrocele, spermatoceles, varicoceles, uh, trauma like fractures and hematomas, and abscesses both in the scrotum and in the, um, in the testicle. Now, I didn't mention inguinal hernias, but um, that's another thing you can see. Uh, you can see the um, loop of bowel actually sliding down into the scrotum when they get uh, large enough um, as, uh, as a peristalsing structure down inside the scrotum itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to talk about ultrasound of the thyroid. 
And when it comes to thyroid, there's a bunch of different tests that you can do to work it up, a lot of which include blood tests, and I'm sure you're learning all about that in pathology. But, um, but with thyroid ultrasound, it can be useful to differentiate a solid structure in the neck that you palpate from a cystic structure, and also to show maybe solid components within a cystic nodule, and to identify if there's more than one nodule or, or multi-nodularity of the thyroid. And also, you can see if there's uh, associated lymphadenopathy or lymph nodes, which we talked about in an earlier lesson on ultrasound workup of the patient with the fever. So I won't go into that now. Um, but one of the things about ultrasound that is limiting, though, is that you can't really reliably distinguish benign lesions from malignant ones. Now, there's certain factors I'll talk about that makes something look more benign, but really you're going to have to um, to definitively say something is not cancer of the thyroid. You really actually have to um, do a fine needle aspiration and send it off for cytology or biopsy it. Uh, you can also do an isotope scan to see how um, how hot the thyroid nodule is or how active it is. And then there's uh, other imaging tests as well um, that can look at the thyroid. But ultrasound is generally considered a first-line imaging study of the thyroid because it's inexpensive, it's uh, quite accessible, it's non-invasive, and um, it's uh, pretty accurate in describing the morphology, how the thyroid looks. And um, when you compare that to when you examine the, the thyroid by hand, how how inaccurate that can be using um, the physical exam, ultrasound really does have a leg up here. And um, you can also see thyroid nodules that you never would have picked up with your hands, smaller ones that were unsuspected on the physical exam. And that's why some really advocate ultrasound for being um, a screening technique for early uh, thyroid cancer. And um, keeping that in mind, however, there is a similar uh, thyroid cancer rate in non-palpable and in, um, in palpable lesions. So just um, something to think about. While the rate of thyroid cancer is similar in both non-palpable and palpable nodules, um, whether patients with screening detected thyroid cancer have better cure rates, quality of life, or survival than patients with clinically detected um, thyroid cancer, meaning through palpation, uh, remains unclear currently uh, due to a uh, lack of research. Now, this is what a normal um, thyroid looks like. Um, it uh, we can see this is the uh, the trachea right here, and we can see the the right thyroid and the isthmus, and then the left thyroid over here. The corresponding metagram is seen down here um, with the trachea, the esophagus. Uh, in this case, posterior. Though I often find the Trach uh, esophagus a little bit left of, of midline. And we can make out this thyroid um, as it goes all the way across here pretty, pretty easily actually with, uh, with ultrasound because it's so superficial. Um, it really lends itself well to using the high frequency linear probe, which gives us really nice uh, images. And um, here's, a, here's an example here of uh, somebody who's got um, just the anatomy here of the, of the sagittal view coming from the side of the body. We can see the netogram with the arterial and venous supply. It's quite a vascular organ. And we can see here this uh, patient's uh, longitudinal or, th or sagittal view of their thyroid st stretches out across our screen when we aim that indicator towards the patient's head. Now, there's a um, when you come across the thyroid nodule, there's a grading system for it. And uh, this grading system has been uh, accepted um, uh, and this was uh, published in, uh, by Fukunari in uh, pharmacotherapy in 2002. Basically, um, grade one, um, when you put color flow on it, there's no color flow inside the nodule. So grade one, color grading system actually means no flow at all. Grade two is when you have flow only out there in the periphery. Grade three is where you've got penetrating flow um, with moderately rich vascularity. And then grade four, the most amount of flow, what they call high velocity penetrating flow uh, with a very vascularly rich um, state. Now, this is an example here of a category two. I didn't show a category one just because it would just look like a regular grayscale thyroid. But this is um, a, a category two flow type pattern here with only um, 
uh, mapping, color flow mapping out in the peripheral area. And then we get down here to, um, this is a transverse ultrasound image here of a mostly cystic uh, th uh, thyroid nodule with a, um, um, a mural component that did contain flow. Uh, the grayscale image initially shows um, just predominantly cystic nodules seen here uh, with small solid appearing uh, mural component seen here by these arrowheads. But then uh, with the with color flow Doppler here um, on the same exact patient shows only only flow out there in the in the periphery. So this um, when we add the color flow Doppler here, it only shows flow uh, within the mural uh, component shown by these uh, arrowheads here, confirming that um, this is actually tissue up here uh, and not just debris. Sometimes you see a um, a component that's within this nodule and you think, you know, is it debris or is it actual tissue? Well, debris wouldn't light up this way with color. So we know that this is actual um, tissue here. And ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration was done where they took a needle into this, um, into this nodule and um, into this region here. And basically the lesion was uh, benign at, uh, at cytologic examination. This next one here is a grade three penetrating color flow mapping with a moderately risk, uh, moderately risk rich vasculature seen here. We can make out the carotid uh, arteries uh, bilaterally here. So this is the, um, uh, the left thyroid. It looks pretty normal to me. Here's the isthmus. We come across the right thyroid and it's got this nodule on it, this uh, hypochoic mass seen over here anterior to the rest of its thyroid. And it shows a moderately rich vascular component consistent with uh, Doppler category three type of uh, mapping. And then finally, here's a category four high velocity penetrating flow mapping with, uh, that's very vascularly rich. And um, you can see that uh, this, there's a nodular structure here, maybe even another nodular structure down here. Another one, I think I see one up here. And there's um, a lot of uh, high velocity penetrating flow seen in this particular nodule. This is um, just a side-by-side -side image of the same thyroid nodule to demonstrate the role of color Doppler. Um, on the image on the left, you see a grayscale, predominantly solid uh, thyroid nodule. That's what this whole structure is here, the thyroid nodule. The rest of the normal thyroid tissue is down here. And then when we add the color flow, we can see um, marked internal vascularity. Um, and when you see all this vascularity like this, it really suggests, at least there's a higher likelihood that this nodule is malignant. And this patient indeed turned out to have a papillary carcinoma of their thyroid gland. So when it comes to certain red flags that make us more concerned for cancer, again, you gotta do a biopsy to confirm it, but um, certain red flags, if the patient's male, um, the extremes of age, they have a nodule there if they're less than 20, greater than 60. If it exudes a rapid growth pattern, if it's greater than four centimeters, or it shows signs uh, of local invasion, like the patient has a symptom of hoarseness or the difficulty swallowing, uh, those kinds of things can make you more concerned about it. So what happens when we biopsy these things? Well, um, the majority of the time, actually, you get good news back. They're benign, 69% of the time, and uh, you follow them up at six to 12 months. And if there's no change, you would probably do nothing. But should, the, um, should there be a morphologic change there, one would consider repeating that biopsy. About 17% of the time, um, you just don't get enough uh, sufficient tissue back in your fine needle aspiration. And I think that when you do it under ultrasound guidance, that is actually less. You get to better um, results. And so that insufficient value there of 17% um, I think that reflects the error prior to doing a lot of ultrasound guided fine needle aspirations. And about one in 10 of them appear suspicious on the path report. And these can be follicular neoplasms, um, of which 85% um, are benign uh, adenomas. But then it turns out that 5% of the uh, total results here are malignant. And so obviously, um, those are the ones that are going to need to be dealt with. So that's what happens when you do a biopsy.
And um, another thing that comes up a lot with the thyroid is uh, Graves' disease. And you can see um, that you've got this really hypervascular uh, thyroid nodule here in the setting of, uh, of Graves' disease. And um, you can see many times the patient's got the prominent um, ocular uh, proptosis. We see here a large goiter in the neck. Um, this whole uh, you know autoimmune situation going on here with these very hyper uh, vascular thyroid nodule seen here, very consistent with Graves' disease when we see that type of pattern, just generally enlarged and hypervascular, just revved up thyroid gland. Now, sometimes you see these punctate echogenicities within a thyroid gland, and that's basically um, a little concerning there for a malignancy. In fact, um, some would even say highly suggestive of malignancy. This is a, a sagittal view here of the thyroid, and we can see this part here has got these not this nodule here has um, multiple fine echogenicities um, with the with the arrows showing here. The arrowheads outline the nodule in the in this thyroid, and um, fine needle aspiration um, and surgery both confirm this was a papillary carcinoma. And here's another example here of punctate echogenicities in the thyroid nodule. Here's a transverse view in this case um, with the arrowheads uh, outlining the uh, thyroid nodule and uh, this um, cystic uh, structure within here. Here's this um, uh, comet tail. Uh, in this case, this comet tail, um, I should say this, this um, echogenic structure here had a comet tail artifact with it. And when you see a comet tail artifact associated with um, a hyperechoic punctate lesion, um, you're a little bit more reassured. And these comet tails um, have to do with the colloid crystals within the uh, thyroid nodule, which are benign. And so I'm going to go back one slide and show you the, um, the punctate crystals that don't have the comet tails. In other words, these are hyperchoic bright dots here in the thyroid that they don't have a, a comet tail that comes down, as opposed to, and I, and I realize as I'm saying this, it's very subtle, but over here, this one does have a, a comet tail. And so this one turned out to be... Um, benign at, uh, at biopsy. And this is a situation here where uh, we're seeing a, a, a sagittal view here of another thyroid uh, mass. This one turned out to be uh, papillary carcinoma. Um, and again, you need to really biopsy, biopsy these to know for sure. This uh, cystic nodule seen here in this thyroid here um, went and had a fine needle aspiration. Um, presumably, it was going to be benign, and indeed, it turned out to be benign on the um, on the path report. And so, um, again, the more cystic these structures are, the um, the uh, more likelihood that these are um, turn out to be um, benign. And it says here, finding the aspiration not performed. Actually, um, there was one performed, and uh, it turned out to be benign. So that's that was good. Here's a uh, another patient here who's uh, basically got. A large goiter and we're doing an ultrasound in our emergency department on this patient's goiter and we're seeing a very uh, large um, multi-nodular uh, structure here that extends out across the, the screen and um, unfortunately they didn't use any color on this particular um, view but if they did you would see a really hypervascular organ consistent with a, with a goiter in the, in the setting of Graves disease. And uh, here's another one here that's got a very large, complex uh, thyroid mass. Some parts are solid, some parts are cystic. And we can see the vasculature there in the neck, carotid, IJ. The carotid is right next to the thyroid. This is the left uh, neck over here. We can see that it's got multiple um, cystic structures to it. Um, and uh, it turned out that we did a fine needle aspiration on this patient, and it came back benign. Just showing you the the way that um, these complex thyroid masses can present. So that's really all I got for the thyroid. It's pretty quick. Um, what we're going to do with the hands-on session is um, just examine the thyroid in a transverse view and then in the sagittal view, just to get a good idea on the anatomy, what a normal thyroid looks like. Shouldn't take very long.